So just in the last few minutes, Dr. Gary has told us that this couldn't have come from bats. It had to go through an intermediate host. That may well be true, but arguing against that is they tested 90,000 some odd animals and there is no animal host that's been found. But what he also doesn't tell you is the animal host could be a, a laboratory animal. It could be passed serially through that. And that's one way of quickly adapting and pushing natural selection to adapt a virus towards humans. Dr. Alina Chan has written extensively about this, how this virus didn't show up clunky and poorly transmissible. This virus showed up immediately very transmissible in humans as if it had been pre-adapted in a lab. Dr. Ebright. Dr. Gary tells us that he's wedded to the scientific method and that uh, he considered all the different possibilities in proximal origins. And I know you're a professor, and I'm assuming you've been the senior author on many papers. I assume that you teach your younger uh, researchers what is good scientific method and not good scientific method. In the abstract of proximal origins, Dr. Gary and his fellow authors state categorically that the virus is not a laboratory construct. That doesn't sound to me like open-mindedness, and I wonder what you would tell a younger researcher or someone you're instructing in the scientific method about putting uh, categorical statements into a scientific paper. Well, it's important to emphasize that the paper in question, Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2, published in March 2020, was not a research article. It was an opinion piece. It was published as a commentary, which is the section in the journal that holds opinion pieces and editorials. So it was an opinion piece. The authors were stating their opinion. But that opinion was not well-founded. In March of 2020, there was no basis to state that as a conclusion as opposed to simply being a hypothesis. Moreover, we know we know that compelling evidence has been presented as a result of congressional inquiry in the House that four of the authors of that paper, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Gary, Dr. Holmes, and Dr. Rambeau, in their private communications show clearly that they knew the conclusion that they stated in that article was invalid. So in terms of what I would tell a younger scientist I would be mentoring, I would tell a younger scientist that you do not state a conclusion without evidence, even in an opinion piece in a scientific journal. And you never, under any circumstances in a scientific journal, state conclusions that you know to be unsound. That represents scientific misconduct. It represents scientific misconduct up to and including fraud. And the paper in question, the Proximal Origin paper, has been recommended for review of retraction. Two requests, one in 2023 and one in 2024, were submitted by teams of scientists to the journal in question, to the journal editors, asking them to add an editorial expression of concern and to initiate a review for retraction of the article. I know of no other example in modern scientific history or publications where a publication has come forward pronouncing with such authority that the lab leak is implausible, it is not a laboratory construct, while privately saying, this is no friggin' con conspiracy theory, it looks like it did, I'm 90-10, I'm 50-50. But no doubt in the paper. In fact, we know that it went back and forth with Dr. Fauci and with editors who say, we want the statements to be stronger. We want the conclusions to be stronger. That was actually coming from nature at the time. We want you to doctor it up and even be more strong because we're making a political point here. That's where we should have known we were off track, that these people were politicians and that they were pushing an idea because as Dr. Collins finally admitted in one of the emails, this is about the business of science with China. This will disturb our relations with China if anybody questions this. Dr. Quay, the idea that this came from the fish market, I thought had been discredited by virtually all of the scientists. Now, I'm really surprised it's still being presented here. I know that uh, the Chinese, uh, the CDC, George Gao over there, uh, basically said that they no longer consider it. And actually, if you think about it from their perspective, we're not sure if we can trust them. But at the same time, the Chinese, if they would rather have it come from a lab or the market, I think would choose the market over the lab. If anything, they would be, if we were going to think they were dishonest, it would be dishonest towards saying, hey, we found some animals. But I, I, if you could review stepwise just a little bit slower some of the evidence for why it's not there, the amount of animals tested, the animal handlers compared to SARS-1, 
but also the idea of this uh, genetic diversity that, uh, you know, when SARS-1 came about the first time, I think it tried hundreds of times because these animal viruses don't infect humans well in the beginning. It tried hundreds of times over and over again. And even in the end, SARS-1 didn't transmit between humans very well. That's why containment worked. And that's why quarantine worked, because it wasn't very infectious. But go through a little bit, step by step, the evidence of why anybody still maintaining that it came from the market is, is misguided. Sure. I mean, let me, let me agree with Dr. Gary about SARS-1 being a spillover. And let me elaborate a little bit. There were 11 cities, 11 markets, three different lineages, and a 30 nucleotide difference among the initial cases and patients which approximately is about a year of posterior diversity, as it's called. SARS-2, of course, there's, there's, it's either in one market or it's in no markets. There's no other prop proposal for, for a market origin from it. 457 animals were tested in the market. Zero were found to be infected. SARS-1, 92 animals, 100% infected. The, 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 uh, the vendors, the wildlife vendors in SARS-1 were all infected. We have 10 vendors here. None of them are infected. One vendor had bamboo rats from, from uh, southern China where the backbone comes from. He, was, he wasn't infected. His animals weren't infected. Uh, SARS-2 has no posterior diversity. So it really, as, as Dr. Anderson said, it's one jump from one animal to one human. The most likely place that happens is in a laboratory. And again, to be clear, when you say an animal, it could be, it could be a petri dish. It could be animal cells in a petri dish. The, the question of where the origins came from is the question of where the animal is. And they've tested 96 animals in nature, and they've tested zero animals at Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's where we need to look. Thank you. I'll reserve the rest for a second round. Dr. Gary indicated that the intelligence community was um, somewhat unified, or a lot of them believe this came from animals, and that's just not true. The ones that have been vocal about this and talked a lot about it have been the DOE, which has more scientists than any other agency in Washington, probably other than NIH. Uh, they've concluded that it did come from the lab. FBI concluded it came from the lab. And we have a whistleblower from the CIA that says the scientists that were convened to study this voted six to one to say it came from the lab, and then they were overruled by superiors for political reasons. So there's a lot of evidence that uh, people within the intel agencies actually do believe that there is evidence that it came from the lab. In addition to people getting sick, there's also about a week in October where they do uh, imagery of who's using a cell phone, and nobody's using a cell phone in the lab for about a week. So the, whole, the lab's completely empty for about a week, and some people think that was during a cleanup period. But if you're sitting at home and you're sort of an independent, you hear scientists over here saying gain of function is the best thing since sliced bread, and over here you're saying, well, we really haven't developed any meaningful uh, vaccines or technology from this, you're like, who do I believe? And who you believe does go to character. And so we have to look at some of the statements. Like I say, I've never seen anything like this between public and private statements. So Christian Anderson, early on in this, sends an email to Fauci, and his Fauci uh, says, Bob, Bob Gary, and a couple of the other virologists, we think it's inconsistent. This virus, this genetic sequence of COVID, is inconsistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. So they, they believed it didn't come from nature. They had looked at this. These are smart people that when they were not looking at it, when they were trying to look at it through an objective lens, concluded one thing until they came to another conclusion that it might hurt the business of science and the arrangements they had going on with China and concluded opposite. But with Christian Anderson, it's stark, it's stark because he says, oh, Bob, and all these, oh, we all believe it's inconsistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. A week later, Christian Anderson is saying, what I like to use when I talk to the public is, I like to tell them it's consistent with the expectations of evolutionary theory. So he goes from inconsistent to consistent, complete opposite approach within days, maybe even simultaneously as these papers are being written. So really the hypocrisy of those involved and those who are saying not a laboratory construct, if you wanna know who to believe, Look at their private statements versus their public statements. So we have gain of function is the best thing since sliced bread, or gain of function is a real problem. Now, Senator Romney's like, well, why does it matter if there's a chance we should do something? I think he's right. If you believe there's a 1% chance we should do something. But if you think there's a 1% chance, or you want to sort of glad hand people at the end and say, well, we should do something, their argument for the people who think it's not likely to happen is going to be, oh, the administration's already fixed this. It's already done, and all we need is a few little regulatory things. We don't need legislation. We don't need independent oversight. We don't need people looking at this who aren't on the receiving end of the money. This is the whole problem of NIH. The people regulating themselves are getting the money. 
So the administration has put in place some regulations to try to, you know, help with the buying of select agents. And Dr. Quay, if you could explain to us uh, what a few MIT scientists did recently and how well the administrative regulations are working without actual congressional legislation. Sure. So three scientists at MIT said they were going to be a red team, and they contacted the FBI because what they were going to do was about to be potentially illegal. Uh, and they put together ricin and the, and the 1918 influenza. Um, th those two are select agents, and they're, they're you know, uh, highly lethal. Uh, and they broke, up, they broke the genes up in a, in a particular way. They added some benign genes, and then they put out test orders uh, following, uh, roughly following the, the White House guidelines, test orders to see if, if laboratories would send them the pieces they needed to build these viruses or ricin, uh, you know, or, or they would stop them. Uh, and in fact, in 94% of the time, they, they sent the pieces right to them. They purposely didn't make the active strain of the RNA. They made the, the inactive strain to show that they could do it. But they proved they could make rice, and they proved they could make the 1918 influenza under the guidance that have just come out of the White House in a way that... Uh, that, that this is, gets at where we go forward. Our next hearing, or one of our next hearings, is going to be, what do we do for gain-of-function reform? What kind of committee do we set up to look at this? And if the answer is, from the other side, oh, it's already done, the White House did it, this is showing you what the White House did, even if it was well-intentioned, didn't work. These scientists got the material off the Internet to create the Spanish flu that killed 50, 100 million people. So this is not something we should scoff at and say, oh, it's not a laboratory construct. We don't do anything here. Let the administration do this. And I would say this if it were a Republican administration. I don't care which party it's in. I agree with scientists like Kevin Esfeld who equate this with nuclear weapons. This is incredibly important and needs congressional oversight on the select agents, but also on the gain of function. Now, some people think this just started. It's incredibly uh, partisan. And I'll just for a quick answer, then a more extensive answer. Uh, Dr. E. Bright, are you part of the right-wing conspiracy? Are you uh, somehow some kind of crazy Republican partisan? I'm a registered Democrat. I voted for Biden. I had a Biden sign on my lawn <laughs> and had a Biden bumper right, sticker on my that. car. That's enough of that. But the, the, main, the main point I wanted to make is this isn't a partisan thing. In fact, when I've talked to Dr. E. Bright, he says he got involved with this after 9-11 when the anthrax attacks came. Um, but then more involved in 2010 as it heated up and everybody was talking about in the scientific community when scientists took the avian flu, which is very, very deadly in humans, but like most animal virus, not very transmissible in humans, and they mutated it. Uh, Fouchier and others in, in, in Netherlands to make it spread through the air and to spread to mammals. That's a crazy thing. And if people think that's a benign use of gain of function, we should never, ever listen to people like that. Who else thinks it was benign and we didn't need to do anything? Anthony Fauci. There have been these two camps. There has been this debate going on for a decade. I think this is a very good debate. It should be an intellectual debate. But realize these are the people, Collins and, and Fauci, who were saying, take these people down. Take down the people we disagree with. This is not scientific debate. They were taking us off the Internet. These are people are not playing under the American rules, not playing under the scientific method, and they should be discounted. But we have to have a real debate over this. So as we move forward, and I'd like to ask you, Dr. Ebright, on this, how important is it that we actually have a law passed and that we actually have regulators that are scientists but that are outside of the uh, supply of money, outside of the exchange of grant money? I think it's a matter of survival. It's that important. There needs to be an entity that is independent of agencies that fund research and perform research to eliminate the structural conflict of interest that has existed with current self-regulation by agencies that perform and fund research. Thank you. 